You okay there? Oh, my legs are dead. <laughs> Never again, man. <laughs> my, my legs are on fire. I thought this would be fun. She is <laughs> bored after five minutes. We are knackered. Meant to have it for an hour because they couldn't do anything less. That's not going to happen. <laughs> no danger, we're staying on this for an hour. We're into the last uh, two weeks of the holiday now, I think we're down to 12 days, um, which is very sad because it's been amazing so far. Um, but I was planning on doing this episode right at the very start, but I ended up starting somewhere else and doing something else. So just a little bit of information about Santa Andre coming up. We had another week down in Periwibi and there's a, a city beside it called Itanging, uh, which is about half an hour drive. and. There's a really cool bar and mini ramp. Just in some guy's house, he's just turned his back garden into a mini ramp and a little bar. So we, we went along there um, on one of the nights that we were there. Here's the, the Instagram and stuff so you can have a look. Uh, so if you're on the south coast of Sao Paulo and you fancy a skate, definitely check this one out. But yeah, we're in, we're in Santo Andre now. And during the time that we've been here, Sant Andre had his birthday and it was 469 years old. Um, so to put that in perspective, uh, my city Dundee is I think 830 years old at this point in time. Brazil itself is like officially, modern Brazil is only 500 years old. That's when the, the Portuguese first came over. So Brazil is a very, very young country. Um, when you look at like places in Italy that have got cathedrals that are a thousand years old, and that's twice the age of sort of modern Brazil. And um, obviously you had your indigenous tribes and stuff there before. So, Santo André is part of the metropolitan area of São Paulo, known as ABC, so Santo André, which is A. And then we've got São Bernardo and São Caetano. Some say there's also a D, so ABCD, which is another city called Diadema. Something I wanted to uh, show as well, um, which I forgot to say when we were in the, the square the other day, so I'm just going to unprofessionally jump in now. Um, the size of all these cities, I've mentioned before Sao Paulo is absolutely huge, and uh, the greater metropolitan area which Sant André um, fits into, but the, the sort of geography of it is crazy because there's no space at all um, between any of these cities, and like, like Natalia said, they're big cities, 700,000 plus in Sant Andre. I think there's even more in Sao Bernardo. Um, Diadem is about 400. There's another one just nearby, Comawa. There's about uh, uh, 400,000 people there as well. The whole area of the ABC is about two and a half million people. Um, and normally, like in the UK, for example, you'll get in a car and you need to drive to the next city. And you've got like countryside, motorway in between. Here, it's like going from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, I'm going to show um, on the screen, but there's no space at all um, between the cities. I think they've just all expanded so much that they've they've all sort of met each other and joined up. I just wanted to point that out because I've never really seen that before. Santo André means St Andrews, so maybe that's why I really like St Andrews in Scotland, because it just reminds me of home, although we don't have the sea here, but anyway. There's a population of around 720,000 people. So it's quite a big city. I've enjoyed living here uh, until I was 18. That's when I left. I think it's a great city, lots of good schools, but maybe the traffic is not great right now. But as Natalia mentioned, uh, Saint Andre in English is Saint Andrews. And I find that quite cool because I grew up about 20 minutes away from St Andrews. So for all the hopeless romantics out there, you might say it was meant to be. It's also quite cool as well. Um, and I only noticed on this trip that flagging the coat of arms for Saint Andre 
is the St Andrew's Cross. Um, so it's almost identical to the Scotland flag, except it's on its uh, side, so it's gone long ways, um, as you can see here, and obviously different colours. So again, I thought that was pretty cool. So today we've came to the Museum of Football and we're standing in the Praça Charles Miller, which is the Charles Miller Square. Charles Miller is very, very important in the history of Brazilian football and in the history of Brazil by effect. He was born here in Sao Paulo. He was the son of a Scottish railway working father and a mother who was Brazilian but had English heritage, like English descent. So Charles Miller is known as the father of Brazilian football and that's because he actually was the one who introduced football to South America. And BT Sport did a very good documentary on it and it's uh, to, all to do with the Corinthians football team here and the Corinthians casuals as they're known now in the UK. It's an amateur side um, just south of London in a place called Tolworth. It's an amazing, amazing story. Um, but basically he played for them once when he was about 15 or 16 and he played really well for them. So when his parents moved back to Brazil, the Corinthians team in the UK gave him two footballs. He brought them to Brazil and to Sao Paulo, and that is how football was introduced. It's a very, very cool story. Try and check out the BT Sport documentary on it. It's really good. It's called Brothers in Football. Uh, so the museum itself is inside the stadium, which you can see the name behind me. Um, there's a shorter name called the Pacaembu, which is the the area, the neighbourhood that the, the stadium was in. Uh, the stadium was built in 1938, opened in 1940, and it's had a couple of uh, expansions since then. There's some work going on at the moment as well, I think to put seats in. It was last renovated in 2007, and then 2008 this museum opened. The stadium's still in use, um, and it's used by the sort of big four uh, Sao Paulo teams, which are Corinthians, Palmeiras, Sao Paulo themselves and Santos and they use the stadium when either like there's a concert on in their stadium or you know something other some other use or like in Santos's case if they need a bigger stadium for a game like if they've got a Copa Libertadores a semi-final or something then they'll play the game here because there's a bigger capacity it's about 40,000 here but anyway let's get inside and have a look around. We're into, I think, the final section of the museum that's been really, really fascinating so far. Um, I think this area um, is just like full of facts and figures and stuff. So, for example, the smallest attendance at a game in Brazil was 55 people. Um, and it was in 1997 as well. So I don't know what was going on in 1997 in Porto Alegre that only 55 people went, but um, that's what happened. The fastest goal in Brazil, just over three seconds. Uh, the biggest uh, biggest score, 24-0, Botafogo in Manguera in 1909. Pele, obviously, his name is everywhere here. Most goals scored, 1,282, uh, which is pretty crazy. This is the guy, Charles Miller, that I was talking about earlier, known as the, the father of Brazilian football. Here is the 17, uh, like the initial 17 rules that were put together um, when football started. Uh, this was in 1886, uh, done by the International Board. 
Um, so they've got loads of little plaques and stuff around here to like for this one is the size of the pitch. So it's the first row over here, the second row, um, the size of the ball, and then that goes through the balls through various phases in uh, football history. Uh, so this year is saying that that international board, um, there's 32 members who vote on the rules. And it says here, uh, England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales, and they all get four uh, votes each because uh, the UK is where football originated and as a result of that they get they get four votes each. So this one's saying here that the first international women's match was 1898 uh, between England and Scotland. And it was the same for the men, they were the first international football game as well, um, but that was in 1872. Uh, this is saying everything is a ball and I could very much remember being at school kicking a can around. And so this is something that I think I should have known, maybe I did but I forgot, but the first ever bicycle kick um, was done by this guy Leonidas da Silva in So we just finished going through the museum, Natalia's just sitting in the back there just getting something to eat and a little drink. Um, I really enjoyed that, that was, that was really really cool. You can see they put a lot of work into making it really interactive. There's 20 AIs per person to go, you need to book a time slot. It's free on a Tuesday for some reason, I don't know why. Um, and the time slot, they seem fairly flexible, we were about 15 minutes past our scheduling. They're, they're not like, it's not a massively massively busy museum so I'm I think they're pretty flexible on letting you in past your slot and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed that. I'm glad we came to that. There's a lot of really nice pieces in there, um, good information all throughout. Options for English, Spanish and Portuguese as well. So if you speak one of those three, you're, you're in for a treat. So we'll call that a day there for episode 10. I think I'll be able to squeeze maybe one more episode out. We've got just over a week left, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so we've got a couple of things still that we're looking to do. Another couple of trips in uh, Sao Paulo, and then we'll see what else happens in the remaining time we've got here. Um, so yeah, I'll conclude the whole trip in the next episode as well. So yeah, please do come back and watch that. And remember, like, subscribe, and share the video, the page, everything like that. It, it really helps out. Um, until the next time.